It is my sincere pleasure to be with you this evening and to be able to present later the prestigious Polestar Awards, about which I've been reading volumes on my 10-hour flight. The notion of economic stewardship is an explicit and recurring theme in business down the ages, in India and in the West, even if it was found difficult to practice. I personally believe it must remain so, even if in recent decades it seems to at times to have almost faded away completely. It implies a responsibility that humans have been charged with to care for all of the gifts, resources is the word that moderate moderns would use today, that we have been given so as to preserve and to pass them on to others and to future generations. In essence, my entire speech boils down to this one sentence. It boils down to trust. And humans, even in their business lives, are essentially trustees. Prudent action relates not only to individual affairs or simple cleverness. It is more than just finding and fitting means to give an end. It is more than being circumspect in handling of assets. It also comprises adjustments of ends to overall goals in life and to the light of changing circumstances. Prudent people handle transformations well because the main resource for their coping with reality lies in themselves in their own minds. In other words, they employ good self-governance as personal responsibility. That is to say, prudence is a way of self-reflective thinking. Socrates is famous for having stated that he knew what he did not know. Not by quantitatively knowing more, but by knowing himself deeper, on a qualitative level. By correctly assessing his own limits, he had an edge on his many contemporaries. Therein lies the true gem of prudence. It implies a wise handling of unavoidable limitations. Prudence lies in knowing what we certainly cannot foresee, and also that we cannot possibly plan everything. And thus we must try providentially to handle such unknowns, such ungivens. Prudence is frankly accepting that we do not have power over everything, and thus trying to forge alliances or devising tools to handle that which escapes our immediate reach. Prudence is hence aiming for the best, while providing also for the worst case scenarios. In a word, prudence lies in wise self-governance. It is rooted in humility on both a personal as well as a cosmic level. Like individuals, firms, and we've been talking about them in our panel here, can be more or less prudent in their corporate self-governance. Just like persons, they face limits to their knowledge and power over themselves over their environs. Like each and every one of us, a business must develop coping strategies for that which is uncertain or untoward. As a people, we long ago developed multi-level systems of implementing prudent structures into our lives. After all, none of us wants to go through a cumbersome process of constant soul-searching in the face of each and every decision, every decision that we have to make. We have built out structures and institutions, habits and procedures that help us to make sound judgment calls. We do this differently depending on the respective level of life concerned. Start on the micro level of the individual. We help our troubled minds along with proverbs, rules of thumb, habits of the heart, feedback from our family, friends, our co-workers. On the meso level of institutions such as firms or 
importantly not for government organizations. We enhance our limited powers of thought and action through the organized assistance of others with whom we share a purpose. At the macro level of government and society, last but not least, we have three groups. Prudent coaches instill in their players certain habits of the heart that guide them through the heart of the heat of the moment. It's when the going gets tough and when the clear and slow rational thinking is difficult that these ingrained cultures prove their mettle. Without them, as every coach knows, the individual players would be swept away by the sentiment of the moment and make choices that are not in the best long-term interest of the team. Whether or not you have a good team spirit or a decent corporate culture is decisive absolutely deciphered and literally determines, I believe, whether a group or a company makes or breaks it. Of course, not every team and not every firm are exactly alike. They must all find their own specific ways to the right kind of collective identity. But this much can be said by way of generalization. In the words of Spider-Man 1, with great power comes great responsibility. Last but certainly not least, there has to be a prudence on the micro level of individual decision making. Every player knows that there are situations where neither the rules of the game nor the culture of the club are sufficient. This is where the individual virtues must come in. This time with a line from Spider-Man 3, we can capture the essence of this notion by saying, it is your choices that define you. Indeed, over time, the greatest factor in the making or unmaking of our successes, political, corporate, individual, is we ourselves. Character counts. It is prudent, therefore, to identify correctly which tool is needed for which problem. Some downsides of the current economic system can only be fixed, I believe, on the political level. Many others fall more to the ambit of my own speciality, corporate governance, corporate culture. And yet others lie squarely with the business persons themselves as leaders, with their attitudes, with their aptitudes, their education, their training, who they choose to be. This is not just the case for the top, the tone at the top of an organization. It is profoundly evidenced at every rung on the ladder in a firm, no matter how hierarchical or flat it may be. Prudence resides at all three levels, what is more in knowing at which level to operate in any given scenario. It's in this spirit that I offer these thoughts to all of you as business leaders, as students, as managers, as journalists gathered here tonight who have the ears to hear and the eyes to see that a reorientation of global business is both needed and within reach. I hope I can present here shortly a set of arguments based on sound logic, historical evidence, current cases from all over the world that will actually begin to convince you even if you're unconvinced now, and make it clear as to why prudence is both necessary and possible. So, I ask you rhetorically, what has gone so wrong? When you lose $35 trillion, yes, that's not a misstatement, you know something has gone radically, desperately wrong. That's the combined global loss until now in assets, private equities, fixed income, real estate, as a result of the most recent over-leveraged financial collapse come deep global recession, $35 trillion. We looked into the abyss and are constantly assured by the very people who should know would have brought us to the brink of the abyss in the first place, that we are still recovering. Most positive estimates, and I am an economist myself, suggest it will be more than a decade 
before we even get back to where we were. At best, then, we have lost a whole decade in terms of savings, wealth, wealth creation, jobs, well-being, possibilities. Analysis from the left and the right show that we were brought to the abyss as a result of risk, scandal, greed, and the misuse of power. In other words, both economic vice and a thoroughgoing lack of prudence. Let us consider two additional and quite different, seemingly unrelated, but actually intrinsically connected global issues. First, diabetes. According to World Health Organization, it is rapidly becoming the leading health ep epidemic globally. It's caused by insulin resistance or by excessive blood sugar in the blood and sometimes caused by unhealthy eating habits. According to that same WHO, is rapidly becoming the leading health epidemic globally. Obesity is no longer just a developed world problem with all of its attendant medical risks, heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, high blood pressure, blindness. It is now rampant in the developing world, most notably in those places with the fastest growth rates, such as China, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and guess where else? India. Upwards of half a billion people worldwide suffer from diabetes. Over a billion people in the world out of the seven billion we counted are obese. That number is estimated to rise to one out of 10 persons in the year 2035, just around the corner. Why? We'll come back to this point shortly. Consider the third plane and ponder our environmental problems. Whether you are an environmental skeptic or a true believer in Al Gore's theories, there is no question that our ecosystem, the environment in each and every country, suffers as a result of pollution, excessive pollution and climate change. The panel on the subject has given us strong evidence that if we don't stabilize and reduce greenhouse gas in the atmosphere at immediate levels, we're in danger of anthropogenic interference with our entire life system. The most recent assessment of report in uh, 2014, uh, earlier this year, they said atmospheric con concentrations of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides have increased to levels unprecedented in at least the last 800,000 years. In other words, humanity is confronted not just with a single global ailment, but with a coming together of apparently different challenges in the economic, social, environmental realities of life in the early part of this 21st century. All of these challenges, I believe, result from a single source. That source is the scope, direction, and quantity of what we human beings are doing, our human enterprise. In the economic sphere of business, we are over-leveraging. In our personal lives, we are over-consuming and overeating. And in environmental terms, we are over-polluting and in the process, literally killing the planet and ourselves. Common to all three problems is an apparent quest for evermore. The ancients would have called this insatiable appetite gluttony when it related to food and greed when it was after money. Today, our more sophisticated terms, we talk about a boundless pursuit of all purpose means for an unopen ended list of unending desires. Yet in essence, we are addressing the same problem. As a result of our own actions, our economy, our health, our environment are all deteriorating and we need to salvage them to survive and to thrive into the future. Today, each of these is a global concern as the planet is unified more than ever by its interdependent link systems. The answer to our chronic ailment is nothing short of lifestyle change what I would call transformation. We need to go on a strict diet, 
to exercise, to take some regular but strong medications. It's like going to the doctor and getting that kind of bad news. It's harsh. This is the case for individuals, for firms, for nations, for societies, and therefore impacts the planet as a whole. The key operating agent, whether we like it or not, the fact is the key agent in our global system today is the corporation, which is why I would single it out. Here, companies need to be reoriented towards responsibility and sustainability, and the virtue, the one I've mentioned already, that can best guide them along that path, I think, is prudence. Prudent behavior should be applauded and heralded, no longer abandoned. So, rightly, as journalists, perhaps, you should ask the question, how can we lead responsible enterprises today? The concern today in the best businesses around the globe revolves around planet, people, and profit, all three. How can all these fit together? What is the role of the responsible leader in bringing them into a common framework? Can they be properly aligned, synchronized, fashioned into a workable whole so as to benefit enterprises and society both? The emergence of sustainable business practices that take full considerations of social, financial, economic, environmental realities of the firm certainly demand a different approach to leadership, a more responsible type of leadership. Global in orientation, since interdependent economy in this 21st century would demand nothing less, such a reoriented corporate notion of leadership must also prepare leaders as global citizens, I believe as statespersons, as ambassadors, if you will. This requires a cosmopolitan ethic a sincere appreciation for culture that goes beyond simple literacy and includes not just mere toleration of diversity, but a deep respect and an honor of the other. This renewed attention to what I call responsible leadership involves three iterations, leadership itself, business ethics, and corporate social responsibility, with a focus on sustainability and a reoriented theory of the firm going forward. You could look at the UN Global Compact, the Global Responsible Leadership Initiative. There are many things to quote here. Purposeful vision of leadership needs to be both ethical and relational. This notion of responsible leadership is essentially different, I'm arguing, from prevailing ideas and the past practices of leadership that got us into these ailments. In the first, if not all, just to look at it at various levels and persons in an organization, I think this is also a bottom-up as well as a top-down phenomenon. It's not something that can be dictated. It's a multi-level phenomenon. It views leadership as responsibility in the first instance and not as a command or a control. Leading, after all, is an active verb, not a static activity, and it's certainly not a given status. Leadership thinking is evolving, has been for decades, and the very definition of leadership, I think, is shifting. It has shifted down the ages and is shifting before our very eyes. There is a long and active academic practical discussion on what precisely a good leader entails. Leadership itself is a cottage industry, Hundreds of books published every year, lots of media, seminars, courses galore, taught by business schools, even my own, gurus, executive coaches, we all have them. Trait-based theories of leadership have long emphasized the attributes of leadership, be it charisma, integrity, cognitive ability, superior knowledge. These theories have looked at leadership from a perspective of psychological and personality traits. Traits like confidence, I would argue, it could be said, employed to excess, end up being contrary to good leadership. Too much confidence. Ultimately, trait-based leadership models, while informative, fail to give a good understanding of how to be a truly responsible leader. Other leadership theories tend to focus on history. 
the great man approach, I'm sorry, too few women, sadly, while others revolve around behaviors of leaders. These theories deal with how one works with deploys, peers, planning, organization, communication abilities. You've heard all these theories. Others look at contingent nature of leadership. Captains and commanders as efficient leaders are often contrasted against counseling coaches who exhibit a penchant for teaching or learning organizations. All of the literature on leadership, and I have to say, in my long life I've had to digest most of it and it fills entire libraries, is relevant but inconclusive. We need to look at the transformational leader if we're going to solve today's ailments. The authentic leader, the spiritual leader, the servant leader. These are models that get closer to my idea of responsible responsible leadership that I'm here propounding. Now, the master teacher, Peter Drucker, who started management thinking four or five decades ago, himself told us some of these same things, that the knowledge-based economy and its modern organizations, particularly global firms, should foster organizational learning. Knowledge should be shared. There should be a long-term understanding of sustainable capabilities as competencies. This combination of focus and realignment can, if executed, usher in a new and a better kind of responsible leadership. It will beneficially borrow from the natural and social sciences. In the first instance, it will learn about how the neurologic nature and connectivity of social partners builds networks of trust. And in the latter, it will appreciate the organic ecosystems of constantly adaptive, dynamic evolution. But responsible leadership in the final analysis is, as Prasad already reminded us, utterly practical. It is rooted in wisdom, and prudence is the central virtue of responsible leadership. It is this kind of leadership that we should consider, especially in light of our current economic turmoil. This style of leadership is non-hierarchical, humble, more akin, as Max Dupree put it in his wonderful little book, Leadership Jazz, to conducting an orchestra, calling the best out in all the performers. Saying thank you is the first and the last rule in such a leadership form. It emphasizes collaboration, trust, and the ethical use of power. There must be a conscious decision to lead not merely to gain personal power, and authority, but to serve the institutions and the people within. This is servant leadership, a philosophy and a set of practices that was coined long ago by the Asians, and we were reminded of it in the 1970s by Robert Greenleaf. Servant leaders strive to give priority to the needs of their colleagues and to those they serve. As humble stewards of organizations, these kinds of leaders have these kinds of qualities. Listening, empathy, healing, awareness, persuasion, foresight, stewardship, growth. They're all about building community. The objective is to add to the common good by helping an organization and the people associated with it to grow and to flourish. In his now classic essay, The Servant as Leader, Greenleaf described the essence of the servant leadership when he said, it manifests itself in the care taken by the servant, first to make sure that other people's highest priorities are being served. The best test and difficult to administer is this, do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? Today, many leaders, and I've had the good fortune to work across many sectors of society and all over the world with these leaders, corporate, not-for-profit, religious, labor, educational, surely political, let's even add in tonight the media. They are too often, in my opinion, on a maniacal trajectory, and at some point they inevitably face what I would call the crucible of power. 
And the crucial question becomes, do they make a redemptive turn and empty themselves by grace, or do they fall and fail to adapt and become yet more dictatorial, more greedy, more authoritarian, often manufacturing a cult of personality around themselves, as too many recent CEOs have done, surrounding themselves with hacks and goons and sycophants and yes-men and people that will do anything at their beck and call. All leaders must decide what kind of leader they want to be. Will they ascend on the arc of wise leadership, giving of themselves in service, or will they storm proudly down the well-trodden path of all too powerful Caesarism, taking no prisoners in their lust for self-aggrandizement? Will they opt to become like Jack Welch, the former CEO, of course, of General Electric, or will they become more like the former CEO of Johnson & Johnson, Ralph Larson? When Ralph was asked what he looked for in a new hire, this was his reply. Are they going to be respectful of the people in the lower positions? That was his test. Greenleaf's credo works for institutions and society as well as individual business leaders. Greenleaf saw humility, as I said, as the key virtue that engenders caring for others. He called humility the rock upon which any good society is built. Although worried that institutions were becoming large, complex, powerful, and personal, he nevertheless realized that institutions are mediating forces necessary and capable of good and capable with the capacity to serve others. These good institutions can be built they can be built using spiritual and social capital that societies develop over a long period of time. Such institutions help to create and sustain entire civilizations. Greenleaf argued that servant leaders inside institutions and across cultures with such an ethic could provide a kind of moral authority. Legitimate power, greatness, comes apart, comes about as a result of these leaders practicing their difficult virtues. That practice leads then to great institutions. Now, every virtue that is not accompanied by humility will likely be destroyed by conceit or narcissism. So, you might ask yourself, as a consequence of hearing me ramble on and on, and ask the leaders that you know, have you had your test of humility? There are important questions that have to be asked to leaders, and the first question is always, who do you intend to be? This is far more important than what are you going to do. Responsible servant leadership is built on character rather than goals. Its greatest sources of support are trust, as I said at the beginning, and abiding faith. It is, in the final analysis, based on questions of responsibility. Practice is changing today. We're seeing all kinds of new leaders emerge, purposeful businesses, businesses expounding responsible leadership values, from IBM to the body shop to Unilever's. Mars is working on a mutuality strategy. Tata, you, of course, know, has corporate responsibility as a strategic concern. The list goes on and on. Is it rhetoric, I ask? or reality. So I believe we are on a precipice, a mega shift, if you will. 25% of the people in 25 uh, countries recently polled said most companies are socially responsible. That is up sevenfold from a generation ago. So like a pencil being pushed across a desktop, at some tipping point, it falls. In my view, that's beginning to happen before our very eyes today in leadership. Responsible leadership is, I believe, moving into the mainstream of business thinking, and we need it. The front line of responsible leadership today entails a greater demand for ethical standards, eco-friendly policies, making corporate responsibility a key part of strategy, and greater prudence, an old virtue, one to be rediscovered. So my parting advice is let us not try to reinvent the wheel. Let us instead look and learn from what the sages of all ages and from all places 
had to teach us in terms of acting prudently with regard both to one's own well-being and particularly to that of others. Thank you.